We have received reports of a bus driver being shot in Dell County and a student being taken hostage. But it's a shocking story that has gripped parts of the Wiregrass all yesterday and today. Well, we're now in day three. Day four. Day five. Day six in the Midland City standoff. Well, our top story this morning is the hostage standoff with insurers yet another day in Dale County. This is a WTBY News 4 special report. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tessa Darlington. We are live out here at the hostage scene in Midland City. We, it is believed that 67-year-old uh, Jimmy Lee Dykes uh, took a child hostage yesterday after shooting a bus driver. Well, Demetra, as you can see, daylight is here and there's still not much to tell. Asking the community to continue to pray. Reg, I spoke to many people in the community who say they wish they could do more for the family of the little boy who is still trapped in that underground bunker. As the situation continues, the health and well-being of that little boy is a top priority. Now, police have confirmed to us that the boy has autism or a form of it. News 4's Muriel Bailey spoke with doctors who work with autistic children. She joins us live from our newsroom now with what she learned. Muriel? Well, Reg, we did find out the boy has re received prescribed medicine and food, and knowing that he has autism but not the level of it still raises concerns. Dr. Mohamed Saleem describes autism as a behavioral disorder, where kids have issues with socialization and speech. He says it can be classified under three levels. It may be mild, moderate, and severe, depend on the impairment. Dr. Saleem says the characteristics depend on the child's age. In this case, family members say the boy is five years old. Around five, they are able to communicate a little with uh, with the adult, but they use adult as a tool, so they don't have good social interaction. Dr. Salim says although he doesn't know how severe the boy's autism is, there is reason to be concerned about the long-term effects this situation could have on him. The problem with autism is that like sudden change in environment affect the behavior. Sometimes kids become more aggressive after the change of environment and sometimes they become more drawn. So more social impairment. Officials have confirmed that the boy is eating, but Dr. Salim says food is another concern. They're very picky eater. Some uh, like soft food, some hard food. So it's affect this, uh, this affect uh, the child in I think each and every way. Now Dr. Salim says once this is all over, the boy will most likely need behavioral counseling. Rich? All right, certainly sad there. Thanks a lot, Muriel. Dr. Salim says with a sudden environment change, children with autism may also suffer from sleep disturbance and have a higher chance of having seizures. We wanted to take a look at some of the people who are actually at that hostage scene, and particularly the negotiators. Of course, we have not been told and we have would never release specific details related to this hostage situation. However, we still wanted to know what it takes to be a negotiator. News 4's Lauren St. Germain has been following that part of this story. She joins us now from our newsroom. Lauren? Tessie, you may be thinking negotiating. How hard could that be? But today I learned it takes a very special type of person to do that job. It's a team that's not called in very often, but when they are, negotiators mean business. Their actions could be the difference between life and death. Little steps are probably the most important steps because you don't want to jump off into anything too big too quickly. The, um, the slower I take it, the more I get to know my hostage taker or my crisis. It's all about staying calm, not giving in, and active listening. This would be the main primary investigator's headset? Right. Not only to the suspect, but also to your team members and any background noise. Being able to listen to a suspect and then reflect back to him what you're actually, what he's actually telling you uh, makes him know that you're listening. And one of the biggest things is, is if you hear someone mumbling in the background, you still know that your hostages are still alive. Adapting to any situation, any person, and knowing the same method may never work twice. Time is on our side as negotiators. Uh, we, we will take as much time as we need. For the team, it's all about connecting to the person, but remaining in reality so the situation is not clouded. If he wants to talk about how he hates the government, you have to be able to talk to him and, and not, not sympathize with him, but empathize with him. And bringing something that's gone from irrationality to rationality. You get there, emotions are high. 
uh, by the time you leave, emotion should be down here. And that's what you're working towards is lowering the emotional uh, stability of it. You know, you want it to be more emotionally stable. Now, in the case of the Dothan Police Department, their crisis negotiation team has nine members, and they all have to go through a 40-hour course. They usually like to have four in the field, consisting of the team leader, primary negotiator, secondary negotiator, and intelligence negotiator. Reggie was at 2 p.m. this afternoon in a press conference when Dale County Sheriff Wally Olson stepped forward and officially released the identity of the suspect at the center of this crisis as 65-year-old Jimmy Lee Dykes. Much has been said about Jimmy Lee Dykes. He was, he was obviously working on something, but he's always working on something. The man believed to have murdered a bus driver on Wednesday and is still holding a small child hostage in Midland City. Many who know Dykes personally have come forward since the crisis broke to shed light on a man they say is unstable. He's always seemed like a weird person. I always thought that that was just the way he is. He has no days or nights. It's that, um, that, that was one of the creepiest things. It was like, doesn't this man ever sleep? And according to neighbors, Dykes never shied away from confrontation. He did not want anyone or anything bothering him. About the third time I told him he needed to calm down, Mr. Jimmy Dykes turned around and ran probably 30 foot to his van and pulled out a pistol. A retired truck driver, Dykes has had multiple run-ins with the law. According to Florida law enforcement records, he was arrested in Panama City in 1995 for improper use of dangerous weapons. Those charges were later dismissed, but five years later, he was arrested again, this time for possession of marijuana. Dykes was actually set to stand trial for menacing charges just one day after this hostage crisis began. One of the most violent reported incidents was when he reportedly murdered one of his neighbor's dogs. He took a lead pipe and he, he beat the dog until he thought that the dog was dead. Many questions remain unanswered as this hostage crisis continues and until they're resolved, the community holds firm to one solution. Pray. Pray. Prayers they hope will make sense of this tense situation and the man behind it all. Reg, now we are standing by waiting on any information that we can pass along to viewers as to where the negotiation stands at this point. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some other things that are going on out there right now because Tesla just talked about uh, Jimmy Lee Dykes. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that underground bunker where Dykes is said to be holed up and uh, it's located behind his camper apparently. And we now have a first-hand account of what the bunker actually looks like. Is that right, Tesla? That's right. Um, and News Force Ashley Edlin has been working on that angle of the story. And Ashley, you actually talked to somebody who has been in that bunker, correct? I did, Tessa. His name is Michael Creel, and he says he lives across the street from the suspect. What also is interesting is that he says he has actually been inside the bunker. Now, that was a year ago, and he says at the time he thought Dykes was building a storm shelter. Creel says he didn't help build the bunker, but Dykes was determined to do that on his own, working night and day to get it done. But Creel helped him unload plywood and a van full of cinder blocks. Creel says his father is the closest thing to a friend Dykes has. He also says Dykes is a very private person. So we asked him, did he in any way see this coming? Very angry person, angry at you know, stuff he sees on you know, news channels and he'd uh, rant and rave about the government a lot. To say I could see this coming, it's hard to say you can see anybody doing something like this. Tessa, the situation just isn't getting any easier, but the community response, I have to say, has been incredible. People in this community are coming out from everywhere and have nothing but positive things to say and hope that we will get this little boy back to his mom safe. Midland City residents are coming together to show support for the boy's safe return. News Force Muriel Bailey watched them today as they spread hope throughout the community. She joins us live from the square in Midland City to continue 
Our team coverage now. Reg, there's actually a candlelight visual going on right behind me, and dozens of people are here. Residents that I spoke with today said they won't give up hope until the little boy returns home safe and sound. People living near the hostage situation were evacuated when this thing started. We're told they haven't been able to get home to get personal items like wallets, cell phones, or even their cars. One lady's dog was trapped inside her home up until yesterday. News for Richie Young Kunis is standing by from Midland City with that woman. And Rachel, our station's very own Tessa Darlington is kind of a hero for this woman, right? That's right, Bethany. Many residents left behind their belongings in a state of chaos when they were told to evacuate by police. And with me now is Sonia Bowman. She left her golden retriever at home when police told her to leave and didn't know when she returned back. For three days, her dog was stranded with no food or water. Sonia, tell me, what was going through your head when you realized you can't reach your dog? I was crying. I was upset. Um, I had called everybody I knew to call. Finally, I called the veterinarian. They told me to get up with the media, and I finally talked with Channel 4 Tessa, and she told me to, uh, that she would try to get a message to him, and sure enough, she she was able to, got it to Mr. Olson, and uh, he called me about midnight last night and told me to come on up when his deputies would take us down to get the dog, and they did. We went down and got him. He was fine, unharmed, happy, running around. He was a little skittish a little bit at first, but he was running wild with the kids today. <laughs> Have you been able to return home? home since then? No, ma'am, we haven't been able to turn, return home since then. Uh, I don't think anybody's been able to return home. About how long is the street? How many neighbors were evacuated? Um, well, from where it begins to where I think that they've done the evacuation, probably around 15 maybe, 15 residents. We have been uh, looking at this all day today and trying to figure out how experts would handle this situation. And here we on the phone with us, we have a veteran negotiator expert. He's with the Kansas City Police Department, Sergeant Pete Edlin. Pete, really, um, we're told that this bunker is definitely livable, um, that he has stayed in there in the past for eight days at a time. How long could something like this go on? As long as they're talking to him, as long as it takes to get uh, the, uh, the the child and uh, Mr. Dykes out of there peacefully, safely, it can go on for a long time. Uh, look at how long uh, the negotiations and the incident went on in Waco, Texas. Uh, that was over a month. Right, exactly. And now when you, you have done this before, when you arrive on the scene, uh, what is one of the first things that you do in this situation to figure out who you're dealing with? The most important thing that negotiators and the people that are involved in a barricade situation need to do is gather as much background information on the, the people involved as possible. And that's an ongoing thing. That, that happens not just before they start trying to talk to the subject, but also throughout the course of uh, the uh, incident's uh, duration, it's important that you get as much information on the people involved, the child as well as Mr. Dykes in this, in this instance. Uh, it's critical that they get as much information as they can. Right. So every day you have to build a profile of everyone that's involved to understand just how delicate the situation is. Um, in an instance like this where the surrounding area near the bunker couldn't be safe, obviously that's going to prolong the situation. How do negotiators handle a hostage situation where the area is not safe? Well, uh, of course the negotiators don't, have, don't deal with that at all. Their focus is on establishing a rapport and a connection with Mr. Dykes and maintaining the uh, the dialogue with him. As far as the security of the area, that's up to the sheriff and law enforcement, other people, uh, as far as making it safe for people and not uh, subjecting the, the anybody else uh, coming to any harm. All right. Now, one of the things that we were told by the sheriff today in this case is that Mr. Dykes has been taking care of this boy. He's been giving him food, water, medication, um, blankets to stay warm. Is that encouraging? Obviously, it's good news for everyone to hear, but is that encouraging for you guys to hear working on the case? It is encouraging, and it, sh and it should be. 
and and that's one reason why they need to keep on talking with Mr. Dykes. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. Again, Sergeant Edlin with the Kansas City Police Department, thank you so much for joining us. Today was a very hard day, not only for the Poland family, but people in our area and across the nation as they said goodbye to a hero. Charles Poland, the man died protecting children on his school bus. News 4's Rachel Young Kunis was at his service today in Ozark. And Rachel, you were able to get a short glimpse into the man's life today. How did it go? Bethany, it was a somber day for the Poland family. Friends and family reached out to pay their respects. To sum up Charles Poland in one word. He is a hero. I know he's a hero. You got a hero among heroes. Friends and family said their farewells to Mr. Poland today. At the age of 66, his life cut short. School directors, state officials, and students gathered to pay their respects. He was a good man. Every day we went to church. He always had some hours. Poland was a beloved man. We know that he was an adored husband, a grandfather, loved so much by his children. He's one to leave a big boy. I know in his family. Charles Poland is recognized as a hero because he didn't flinch and he didn't hesitate to risk his life for those children. He made the ultimate sacrifice while saving the lives of children. That he, loved so he died tragically, but friends say he always protected the ones he loved. The Chuck was the last bus. Opal too was the last bus always to leave. And I thought how appropriate that Chuck always kept our back. Some say his fingerprints won't disappear from the lives he touched. For Christmas, he gave me a, a keyboard because I love piano lessons. And now I have something to share about that. Children from his bus wrote letters to his family, saying those bus rides were the best times of their lives. One student aspired to be like Poland, writing, Since you were the nicest person I met, I'll be the same way. And now, he's more than a hero. Now, Mr. Poland is an angel. He's watching over Ethan and his family. He loved sitting on the porch with his wife, Mary Janice, watching his loved ones. Now he's sitting in the clouds, still watching his loved ones. On the way back from the cemetery, three buses followed the procession to represent Charles Poland still has their backs. Bethany? All right, thanks, Rachel. Some very touching interviews there. And if you would like to share your heart with the Poland family, we have created an In Remembrance page in honor of him on our website at WTVY.com. Since this tragedy in Dale County started, people from all over have been coming together in prayer. Today, people held signs on 231 North that said to pray for the child and the man involved in this sad situation. Families like the Johnsons say they have no ties to anyone in this, but still knew it was important for them to get involved. The number one most important thing that anyone can do is to pray for not only Ethan, but for Mr. Dykes as well. It is the most important thing we can do. They stood on the side of the road today for hours, and they hope their actions will remind people not to lose faith. And of course, in traumatic situations like this, uh, the one in Midland City, experts say children need to be watched carefully for signs of distress. News Force Deanna Betneshi joins us now from the scene with more on that. Deanna? Bridge, there's a lot that goes into caring for a child who has witnessed the trauma, and the first step in their healing process is to show them you care. For the children who were in that Dale County school bus when their driver, Charles Poland, was shot and killed, school may be hard to get through. But child psychologists say there are things teachers and parents can do. To encourage them to talk about it and to talk about their feelings. But Philip says sometimes children have a hard time communicating their feelings verbally. Just to encourage them to draw. To encourage them, draw your feelings or draw, uh, draw what, you, what you saw. And most importantly, show the child love and let them know they're now safe. Sometimes this kind of thing requires a lot of patience on the part of us 
as parents or the adults. Philip says some kids will show trauma symptoms. Nightmares are a very common thing that goes with trauma. Secondly, being hypervigilant, kind of obsessive about, um, you know, safety issues and that sort of thing. Mama, did you lock your doors? Uh, you may see some agitation, restlessness. There could be some irritability, problems concentrating. But others may still be in shock and not show any signs of trauma for weeks or even months. For a child who's experienced this trauma, there's an acute stress response uh, that's usually within the first four weeks. But after that period of time, children can, if they continue to experience symptoms, may develop into another type of pattern like separation and anxiety from their parent or depression or post-traumatic stress. Until this hostage situation comes to a close, psychologists say be as open as you can with your child and let them know expressing their feelings is okay. Now the Red Cross is offering mental health counseling for those families that need it. Afternoon everyone, I'm Reginald Jones. Hostage situation in Dale County in day seven. Let's go directly to News Force Bethany Anderson for the latest update. Bethany? Reg, we're told by neighbors that they just heard gunshots go off, several gunshots. Matter of fact, I could hear them. They were so loud from all the way across the street where we're standing. We have to interrupt your programming to bring you some very latest news on the hostage situation there in Dale County. It appears that the hostage standoff is over. Uh, CBS is confirming through Homeland Security for us that Jimmy Lee Dykes, the man who stepped on that bus uh, last Tuesday, uh, shot the bus driver and then took uh, a little boy hostage. Uh, he is dead and the little boy, we're told, is safe right now. News Force Tessa Darlington has made her way out to the scene right now. She's been uh, following this story since its inception on last week. She joins us now with more information. Tessa. Well, Reg, I can really just confirm what you have already said. We have confirmed through Homeland Security and through CBS News that Jimmy Lee Dykes has been killed and that the little boy that has been held hostage for seven days now is out of the bunker and he is safe. At approximately 312 this afternoon, FBI agents safely recovered the child who has been held hostage for nearly a week. Within the past 24 hours, negotiations deteriorated and Mr. Dykes was observed, was, a, was observed holding a gun. At this point, FBI agents fearing the child was in imminent danger, entered the bunker and rescued the child. The child appears physically unharmed and is being treated at a local hospital. The subject is deceased. Jimmy Lee Dykes' standoff with the police is over tonight. Just kind of walk us through what happened last Tuesday. Um, I was doing my homework. Mr. Poe was doing his round off. Some man got on the bus asking for children to, like, six to eight. And then when he saw us, he wanted, he kept picking, and he picked my older brother. But he said, I, I don't go to strangers. And then everybody started doing that. And then Mr. Poe got mad, and he put it in reverse, and he shot him. And we were just shocked. So... Did uh, the man actually come onto the bus and walk down the bus, or how far did he actually get on the bus? He was like, there was three steps to the bus, so he was like at the second step, and he was holding on to like the bus. What did you do when that, when that started happening? I was shot. I was like this. I was just trying to duck down, cover my ears, hope I don't hear no gunshots. And when I heard of, I was just like panicking. Like, what do I do? A sigh of relief tonight as a little boy taken hostage nearly a week ago, is now safe. It is believed right now that the little boy was taken to Flowers Hospital. And, um, and I can tell you, as soon as I got here, we were waiting to see if um, Trooper Kevin Cook and or Sheriff Wally Olson would come over and speak to the media. They came over and spoke to us, and Sheriff Olson gave a quick sentence which simply said the little boy was safe and was okay. This really has been an emotional roller coaster for the past seven days for those who have been close to this case. Uh, Sheriff Wally Olson and District Attorney Kirk Adams both joining me now here on the set to talk a little bit about uh, what has transpired over these past seven days. Thank you, gentlemen, both for being here uh, with us tonight. It's been a tough day for you. It's been a long day, um, but, you know, we stayed focused on what our mission was ultimately and we accomplished that mission today. And, and of course, Throughout all of this, everyone's concern was for this five-year-old child. I'm sure that was very important 
to all of you all who are out there on the scene. That was our main goal, was to bring Ethan home safely. And you accomplished that. That's correct. I, I know that there's a lot you can't talk about uh, concerning the case. Can you mention anything about how the bunker was breached? No, not, not at this time. We're still in the process of, you know, we have a crime scene to process. So sure. we've still got to go back and uh, go back through all that. And it's, we've still got a lot of work to do. There has been questions about whether or not Ethan had been in contact with his mother throughout this ordeal, whether or not you all allowed her on the scene. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that well, any at all? I can tell you this. Uh, through Victims Crime Services, we kept her up to date constantly you know she she was notified of you know everything that was going on with us and uh, you know we maintained a relationship with her you know because we we know how important it was to that she she was concerned you know sure. and everything so we we stayed in constant contact with her and Kirk you you have been uh, I, I've seen a video of you out there practically the entire time as well. What is your office, what role has your office been playing in all of this? Well, advisory, most part, but I told the sheriff from the beginning I was on standby, good or bad, and I supported everything he has done. Uh, there were a lot of agencies there, however, Sheriff Olson was always in charge, mm -hmm. and he was able to bring all these outside agencies together, and they worked as a team like you couldn't believe. I think Sometimes there's a reputation, you bring in certain agencies and things don't go well. It went so perfectly, but only because of the leadership of Sheriff Olson. And I think Dale County should be proud that they have such a compassionate, caring, and Christian man as their sheriff. And those leadership skills shined this week. And let's talk a little about, because uh, typically I've been here for 15 years, and typically during crisis or in a time of need, our communities have responded overwhelmingly. Let's talk about the, the community's response for this, this Well, situation. I think everybody's number one goal was to bring Ethan out and make it safe. And I think the constant prayer requests that came in, the volunteers, even the people at Destiny Church, basically these, the law enforcement took over the church. And it was because they allowed that to happen as the headquarters. The food that came in, it was overwhelming. In fact, most of these agents that came in from other parts of the country had never seen anything like this on any mission they've ever been on. They were overwhelmed, and one of the agents was from Georgia and said, hey, this, we're from the South, this is how we do it here. And uh, it couldn't have been done without the community support and prayer. There's too many to name, but that kept Sheriff Olson going. I know it did, we've talked about that, and I think he may speak to that as well. Sure. It's, it's, it's really overwhelming when you get this many people together, especially in a law enforcement family, and being able to stay focused on your mission and not stray from it. Um, it's just how everyone, I mean, you see, you would see it in the eyes of the, the, the guys, the men and women that were on that scene. You know, their hearts were breaking as well. I sure. mean, they've got kids at home, you know, and, and it can be our kids, you know, and so we, we want to do everything possible to bring this child, child home, yes. you know, and that's, that was what it was and, all about. And that was accomplished, and, and you, everyone should be commended for that. Now, it, it is still an active scene over there. Absolutely, yes, and, you know, I ask people to please, you know, be patient with us, you know, that's the one thing, you know, we have still have a lot of work to do, sure. you know, and uh, it's going to take time, and that's, uh, ever, the community has been great, you know, the, the neighbors and everybody around us, they've, they've really been good to, to be patient with us and you know because I mean you got a lot of people that hadn't been able to return to their homes you know and and we've we've really been an inconvenience you know your church family would been an inconvenience too but at the same time they knew how important this mission was and they pulled together and and helped us with this you know it's just people helping people right? well, that's what it's all about and it, it certainly has worked for us in, the, in this situation I know it's been a, a, a really long seven days for you guys and we appreciate you all taking time out to come and talk to us tonight and let's let's make one 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 final thing clear to our viewers there we had viewers who were posting things on our Facebook page they were getting very frustrated uh, because information was not coming forthcoming a lot and we tried to explain to them uh, that you guys were not releasing a lot of information because you didn't want to jeopardize the safety of that child. You know, in, in the course of this whole operation, anything that we released could have been detrimental to, to Ethan's life. You know, and, and, and I, I feel the frustrations from the community, you know, because you, you, 
if you don't know all the details and all the facts and everything that's going on, I can understand that. And I do, and it's like I told people, you know, we're doing everything humanly possible to think of it any possible way to bring that child to safety and and you know and you can't rush that you've okay. got to take that time and mission accomplished mission. gentlemen thanks so much for being thank here you. with us tonight we really appreciate you taking time out thank you Rick. thank you and great job thank, thank you, you. Thank very you. much